The masochist in me decided I need to invite some guests who are, I don't know, most likely to derail the show and just take over because they are themselves hosts. They are strongly opinionated and really moral anarchists. And so I thought, well, who better than Shannon Q and Paula Gia? So welcome to the show, my friends. Good to have you. Thank you. Uh, that's a compliment, by the way, when I say you're most likely to just jump in and just tear things up. You like to break the furniture and whatnot in the best of senses. I'm it's also just I like moral anarchists. <laughs> <laughs> Apology, a host of the uh, YouTube channel and uh, social media pages, does a lot of counter apologetics. A former Christian, devout Bible believing Christian, would that be a fair way to say it, Paul? Absolutely. Bible believing, Bible memorizing, all of it. And he's one of those delightful atheists who knows more about the Bible than many of the Christians that he engages. And he has also said he is prepared to go to hell to save the rest of humankind. And I'm coming back to that. Uh, Shannon Q's current handle on Twitter, which is still not X, by the way, is Woke Drunk Girl. She's also a YouTube presenter and activist. Her probing topics include, is there gender in heaven? And she likes to post images of sweatshirts that say, sorry for having great tits and correct opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon, Shannon will also not be paying more for burgers at Wendy's during prime time. And I think that's a moral stand that you should be. Anyway, I'm glad you're both here, my friend. <laughs> Both. Yeah, my Twitter handle is always whatever the I think the funniest insult that comes through my YouTube channel or any other YouTube appearances that I have, whichever one is the most uniquely insulting. I just take that and I make it my Twitter handle. That, so that bizarre. was the call in show. I'm pretty sure the woke drunk. They call. go after Paul. And they're like, well, your argument sucks, or you're an idiot, or you're this, or you're worshiping the God of atheism. You know, they go after you and it's, oh my God, look at her hair. I, it's this weird shift that happens and it has to do with your voice and your laugh and your appearance. And I don't know, it's just a different temperature. I'm not reading that wrong, am I, Shannon? No, I'd say that that's accurate. I'd say that most women in this space would probably share that experience too it's just, it's more likely that when someone is hearing a woman talk about something that they disagree with or don't know how to argue against they're going to directly attack them based on their appearance or based on their gender and i just find it funny so i, do, I take the power away from them by just not giving that any quarter in my world and then just owning it so that's it's why funny. i'm the woke drunk girl uh, forgive me. I saw somebody on um, uh, online, and sh she was talking about her direct message. You know, her her inbox, and she's like, "Okay, here's a guy who wants to go out." And so, I mean, the idea is, woman exists. Man says she must want it, right? I mean, it just always seems to go down like that. Of course, it's a great bully tactic to go after whatever they think your greatest insecurity is. And so, for someone like me. They try and go after my intelligence, assuming that that's the thing that I maybe am either most prideful of or most insecure about. And so I think they see a woman a lot of times and they imagine that the greatest insult they can give them is something about their appearance. Just since Shannon and I live in the same house, it is very strange to see the difference in our in, in how people attack us. So you're not wrong. No, you two know each other. I always forget. No, never mind. I'm absolutely lying. Not that you can tell because it looks like I live in like love and light and he lives in a dungeon. <laughs> Which is, I think, probably a symbolic. I want to get into the whole hell thing with Paul because he is prepared to make the ultimate uh, sacrifice for the rest of us. First, I want to talk to Shannon. She deals in or at least speaks to labels we get hung up on them here are you an atheist are you an agnostic atheist are you a gnostic atheist are you a hard atheist on the dawkins scale what's your number are you spiritual <laughs> shannon what do i do with all that and what's your perspective you tell me my perspective when it comes to the realm of the debate over the definition of atheism is that it's way overdone and over focused on 
and that people get hung up on it um, and try to tell each other what labels they should have. And I find that exceptionally frustrating. The label of, of atheist, if you own it, like whatever you perceive it as for you is what matters in the context of whatever conversation you're having or whatever perception you have about the reality that you live in. And labels are kind of something that only function in so much as they have like utility in this specific context. So in general conversation, if you describe yourself as an atheist, somebody's going to have like a philosophical or a psychological construct of, of what that means. If they're confused about it, they can ask you and you can clarify. I agree that within like very specific realms of philosophy, you need to be more shored up with the terms and use them very consistently in a very specific way in that realm. Otherwise, the ambiguity can bleed in and you're not speaking in as precise terms as you need to. But that's a very different realm than people who are just walking around day to day, just deciding what to describe themselves as. I'm a guy with atheist in the title of his channel. I understand the utility of labels, right? right? It, it's good to be able to sort of set yourself in as, at least a relative category. But I am struck by... I don't know the reductive nature of it. I have people call my show and they're like, well, I don't know what to call myself. And I'm like, what do you want to call yourself? You don't have to call right. yourself anything. We're all on the journey, right? I mean, life is a journey. Just take the journey. We'll figure out the terminology after. That's fair, right? Or worse than that, they'll land on something that makes sense to them and they'll start utilizing it. And if you ask them, they'll, they'll clarify what it means, the way they're using it. And it usually lands somewhere around the colloquial understanding of the term atheist. But then you'll have people who are like gatekeeping what you can call yourself because they only want you to use the terms the way that they're used in like really sort of like bespoke philosophical circles. And those are the circles that the general population travels in. So it's not the same sort of utility and trying to force people into that corner where, where they now have to like use terms in a very specific academic way is... I don't, I don't think it's beneficial. And it's also focusing on the entirely wrong thing, right? Like people are, are going through when they're deconverting quite often, sort of like a gradient of self-discovery regarding what they do and don't believe and why they do and don't believe it. So having like a stringently applied label that can only be utilized one way that they need to like understand great deal of philosophy in order to be able to know that they align with doesn't seem to have a lot of utility to me. It doesn't seem beneficial for a person going through that journey. I can see how it is beneficial if you're trying to write a paper about somebody's position towards the existence of God, and you need to use very definite terms that are understood very clearly in that realm. But I don't think it's the same thing in general society and attempting to take it out of that realm and say, well, that also needs to exist here where we label ourselves. Uh, it just is, is a little bit ridiculous. And there's so many more better, more interesting, more important things to focus on that when we consistently get caught up on it and argue about it, that seems kind of like a privileged position to me to be able to spend so much mental energy focusing on what label somebody else should have because it doesn't adhere to your understanding of that label is, is a very privileged position. Like I, I'm lucky for you. I'm so happy for you that you don't have better things to worry about. That's nice for you, but like leave that person alone. Like if, if they say they're an atheist and you have a general understanding that that means that they don't believe in a God and you ask them and they clarify, just move on with your day. Don't tell them that they have to justify philosophically the way that they're utilizing that word. You don't do that in any other realms. I'm not sure why we do it here. Let me bump over to Paul real quick. I'm sure you've got an opinion. Do you think some of that's insecurity? Like I call myself this, so I need everybody else who sort of aligns with me in terms of what opinion, value, whatever. I need them to validate me by identifying as me, or is that reductive as well? I'm not so sure it's that necessarily. I think that it, a lot of times, well, as you know, you've been in the realm of being a former Christian. I'm sure you get a lot of times Christians wanting to gatekeep who can use their label, who is really Christian, who's not. That is a favorite pastime of Christianity is you know, telling self-declared Christians that they're not. I think part of it, what I'm seeing at least in my counter-apologist realm, is that people want to make you say that you are a hard atheist so that they can 
give you a gotcha of, well, you can't disprove God, so your position is ridiculous. And to a, you know, Cartesian certainty kind of a level of things. And so if someone is casually using the, the term atheist, they think it's a opportunity for a gotcha. And if they force you to downgrade to agnosticism, then maybe there's a chance to convert you. That's how I see, at least from the other side, I see this going. And then internally, it feels perhaps like it's, I do think that we on the non-belief side, and I prefer non-theist, that's just my favorite word for it all. There is sometimes a hierarchy of we're the smart ones, we thought our way out of this thing, so we need to use the most intellectually rigorous language all the time uh, as sort of this badge that we wear, as if we are smarter than the people who still believe, which I don't think so at all. I didn't gain a single IQ point when I deconverted. So I don't know. It's it's both uh, it's both for the arguments and I think for your own ego. That's yeah. that's how I see it. I totally hey, I don't agree. Know. I think it's of oh, some story. I'm go chaos. ahead, Shannon. No, go it. ahead. I mean, it's, it's I, I told I told everybody you'd take over, and it's moral anarchy. <laughs> so go ahead. Go ahead. So do you think it's on two fronts though? Because I think that that's the case. I think that Paul, you're 100 percent right, and that when we're engaging with like an apologist, they want you to define what you believe in a very specific way. They want to like paint you into that corner so that they can use that as a way of like undermining your position. And I think maybe the two are even connected because there's the really philosophical atheists that exist in the public sphere. And they, because they see that happening maybe, and they feel as though they know how to answer that question, they possibly like genuinely want to arm people with the ability to more to better formulate their position in those circumstances so that they can articulate it better and kind of withstand that onslaught but also maybe are a little bit frustrated that people aren't engaging in that space or people aren't engaging well in that space or at least as well as they think they could so they get frustrated because they see these people maybe even like us who are engaging with apologists and not using the philosophical definitions, but having philosophical conversations. And they feel as though they're not well represented or their like little corner of the community isn't well represented in those instances. And they want thus to kind of like impose those definitions upon, upon us so that they can be better represented because we're kind of their proxies. Do you think that might be something? I think that's, I think those are the guys that gave us before I even became an atheist the hat tipping, you know, fedora. The fedora meme. guys. <laughs> yes. uh, I think, I think those are the guys that want to say, you know, atheism has to mean one thing or agnosticism has to mm -hmm. mean another. Um, I don't know. I tend to just let people self-identify. I think the most important thing in any conversation I have, I have theists on all the time. Like defining terms is the first. 10 minutes of the show always because yeah if you're just I, and i'm willing to take almost anyone's definition on any word as long as we're just using the word in the same way mm -hmm. we need to move on and each conversation you have to ask it's tedious but you have to ask that question every single time what do you mean by moral what do you mean by right what do you mean by christian all the, just i don't know it's Sure. I mean, clarification, I think, serves everybody. I buy but that. Being prescriptive about language, I don't find to be helpful, just in yeah. general. I don't know why I started with kind of a dry, sort of mm -hmm. a clinical question. Like, I should have sort of segued as, you know, we should have dipped a toe into the shallows and ask a question like, do you put salt on watermelon? Which, of course, the answer is always universally yes, you must always salt watermelon. Why? No, no, no. It makes it I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My do I have a watermelon Philistine? I <laughs> do I have a watermelon Philistine in my midst? Because this, I we will fight. I have watermelon here in my fridge. I've never even contemplated doing that. Oh, it's pretty good. <laughs> what is that? Never mind. Oh, I'm going to leave it to the comments section. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> so, no, I don't know I what's can, happening. I'll try it after. Maybe I. No, like, how can you eat watermelon without? So, you have to. I'm salt agnostic it. about it. I've never had the experience. <laughs> so, but are you an are you an agnostic atheist? Are you a, a a seeker? Are you on a journey about salted watermelon? I lack okay. a belief in salted watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> You're unconvinced. Actually, I'm Shannon unconvinced. has salted water. <laughs> She has salted watermelon melon hidden this. She was unaware of it until I, like, I, I see. Ago. You know what? She's a salted watermelon denial. We all believe in salted watermelon, even the people who don't. I'm going to get to that mm -hmm. apologetic in just a second. Uh, Paul, you said that you are willing to like be Elspeth and Dragon Slayer. You're willing to stack the lottery and go and endure the dragon fire. You are willing to go to hell to save all of humankind. Talk to me about this particular statement and its context, <laughs> if you would. Well, the, you missed the important opener, and that is that I'm not particularly a fan of people. People aren't my favorite. <laughs> I don't universally love. I am not all loving, all benevolent. I tend to be a bit of a loner. And, but I often think about divine hiddenness when I'm out walking my pup. I, and when I'm just out doing around the house, divine hiddenness for me is the strongest argument. And it still weighs on me a lot is that if there's a God that wants to have a relationship with me, the prerequisite is that I know he exists. So anyway, the other day I was thinking about how, you know, for God so loved the world and that the greatest love is that one lays down his life for his friends. But I thought about this and it's like, well, no, it's actually I think it's merely pragmatism. I think that myself, who doesn't even love every human, who doesn't particularly necessarily like every human, I still would happily, for the sake of billions of other humans, not only endure the torture and the death, but also do the descent to hell just out of pragmatic. I have a number of children in this world, and even just if for them, but but I would do it even if I didn't have kids. Just I think. Out of pragmatism, most of us would do that, and we celebrate that in movies, we celebrate that in stories, people who sacrifice themselves for people they don't even know, and um, it doesn't take the greatest act of love in the world to do this. And it's even worse, of course, for God when you layer on that when Jesus did that, he knew after three days he was going to be exalted to glory. Uh, I wouldn't even be exalted to glory. I'm willing to just go and be the lone human in hell. Uh, you know, so that everyone else can have the party. I, and I, I'm guessing most people listening to this, if they thought about it, would also uh, give their life in, in this way. So it, it's maybe this, this narrative we've been told about how this is the greatest act of love ever isn't so great. It's funny, uh, on Good Friday every year, I insist on posting that meme that says, shout out to Judas for the long weekend. I don't know why. I just always thought that was funny. Uh, Shannon Q, you recently engaged in a debate on YouTube with an activist and apologist named Duncan Atheism. Oh, dear God. <laughs> That's what I, I said. The most watched debate I've ever done. That's what I said after 12 minutes of watching. Uh, Duncan Atheism is also known by some other names, but uh, just f set that up for me, if you would, Shannon. Oh, okay. So this was a, a little while ago. He's mostly known on the internet as Darth Dawkins. Um, that's the most watched debate I've ever done. I've done several, but this is the most watched by far. Um, I don't actually consider it a debate. What happened was there's a channel called Modern Day Debate. He was supposed to be debating somebody else that person backed out about like an hour before they were supposed to do the show. Uh, the show reached out to me and said, would you be willing to do it? I said, I don't really do debates, but I'm happy to have a discussion. I would like to talk about, you know, if, if he wants to talk about why I don't believe most of my non-belief hinges on the soul. That was like kind of my deconversion linchpin or morality. So let's talk about the soul. I went on to talk about that and progressed okay for a brief period of time. And then it clearly descended into, it was very obvious that he was a presuppositionalist who really wanted to get me on a script and not actually talk about the topic of conversation that I was under the pretense we were gonna be there 
to talk about. Um, no, it didn't take I, long before he was like, oh, your performance today is absolutely abysmal, Shannon. You know, it's almost like you should be embarrassed for uh, for how you have represented atheists today. But he said something interesting. I'll let you speak to this. He was saying the reason you can know anything is because it was revealed by God. And yeah. you're like, well, hang on. How would you know it was a revelation if he had not yet revealed it to you? Was that was I reading that right? How you know, like how do you yeah. make the decision or how do you realize or acknowledge the revelation that you are getting if you can't know anything without God's revelation, right? Right. That that's what I thought was circular because he was saying basically like the base of precept is that, you know, like all of the laws of logic, everything, like God is the base for that. But you have to justify that somehow. And the way that they seem to justify it is to say that it was divine revelation. But if it was divine revelation, to be able to know that it was divine revelation, you would have to just have like an infinite loop of divine revelation. And that kind of seems like nonsense. That doesn't seem like a solid founding. It's just an assertion. But he wasn't interested in exploring that more so he his tactics seemed to be, or at least his rhetorical strategy seemed to be to abuse people to put them on the defensive. And then once they were on the defensive, he could use that emotional reaction in order to kind of pre present them as maybe not as strong intellectually as him. And I picked up on that fairly quickly and realized I wasn't going to be able to have an honest conversation with him. So instead of trying to have a dialogue, because it was clear that that was disintegrating into nothing, I decided that I was just going to amuse myself, basically, and <laughs> point out all of his rhetorical strategies to the audience as we were going. So It was a teaching moment. It was a teaching moment. <laughs> Well, Which this I is, guess I people enjoyed. I don't know. Apparently, it was a really high no. It's never a dull moment, Shannon. When <laughs> when you're on, on and I would get Paul in on this one a little bit. I'm struck by the precept leap. Uh, Presupposit. I guess we need to define it, but the presuppositionalist always speaks in terms of these deistic, nebulous watchmaker, first cause, the one who set the uh, the guidelines, the objective moral standard in place. And we can only know right and wrong because we are referring or leaning on that standard. But that's not a theistic argument. Like the William Lane Craigs, et cetera, who get into this first cause business and the objective moral standard business, then they just, they take this Grand Canyon sized jump over to their specific God with a proper name. That's been your experience, Paul, or am I, uh, do you know some people who've actually managed to con or try to connect dots in some way? Oh yeah, no, I think you're talking about the leap of like a, like the Kalam cosmological argument, for example, really only proves that if, if you accepted it as sound and, va and valid, that you would, all you'd get to is that the universe has a cause. There is no dot, 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 therefore God. Now I'm going to need to uh, have you define Kalam for those who may not be oh. aware, because we're all speaking insider knowledge here, insider Fair enough. terminology. Go ahead. When I say Kalam cosmological argument, that's a label that is put on actually a family of arguments that basically wants to insist that everything that begins to exist has a cause, the universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause, is ultimately the, the extent of this argument, but uh, Christians and Muslims and theists often will wield this as if that gets you to a God. And then, you know, as you mentioned, secondly, to their specific flavor of Jesus that they prefer. And so obviously that's, that's not going to work. I think the other thing you were alluding to was that oftentimes the presuppositional art, um, argument really doesn't even get respect from other Christians a lot of times because it goes a step further than what you said in that they say, not just that you can't know right and wrong, but that you literally can't know anything. I can't know that there's coffee in this cup unless God at one point in time revealed to me that the universe is here. So they go that whole one step further and that's what makes conversations like that Darth Dawkins one and the way Shannon exquisitely handled that better than any pre-sub conversation I've ever seen is so frustrating because it gets so massively circular. They can, well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know that? Uh, they, they, they terminate the infinite regress by just saying that God told them, which of course is ridiculous because as Shannon pointed out, there's no mechanism in our brains to tell us that our maximum level of certainty is just our human maximum level of certainty or that God came down and gave us that certainty. 
that's the thing. There's no mechanism to tell the difference. So um, that's the whole swirl. And so watching Christians fight Christians is a hobby of mine. So presuppositionalist <laughs> camp, uh, not necessarily that respected compared to, and uh, they're the same arguments as you pointed out ultimately, but the, the highfalutin ivory tower, the William Lane Craig's and the other academics in these fields, um, they're ultimately not really giving that a different argument. They're packaging it more intellectually or less intellectually. I mean, how much of that is just freaking word salad? I was reading an article by apologist. I don't even know if he's still alive, but he's been doing it for half a century, Norman Geisler. Mm, and yep. it's just, I mean, it's all of these lofty terms and it's, you know, it's abs. It's like this, well, now we have to get all exegetical because the Bible's not enough. So let me explain what God really meant in the Bible. But it does Frank raise Turk the question. Is the one who's, Frank Turk is the one that's carrying on the torch for Norman Geisler. I, I see. Is Geisler, somebody Google that. Is Geisler still on? Never mind. It's, it's not important. The ideas are important. Mm -hmm. um, do we have some, I mean, how do you know murder is wrong? How do you know rape is wrong? Is there an objective? Do you believe in objective ethics? How do you approach that? I don't even know who to start with. Either one want to jump in? We talk about this all the time. Paul and I, because um, I think morality is one of the most interesting subjects to, to get into. Um, I don't think that there's like an objective morality that exists in the ether. And even if there was, we don't, we wouldn't have access to it. So it would be functionally useless. I think morality is the term that we give to our ongoing discovery of how to best interact with each other in society um, to all of our mutual benefit. That's what I think it is. I don't, and I think that once you define it, like once you give it that term, you can do objective things to reach those goals. Like if you define the term morality as doing like what's best to reduce harm and increase flourishing, if it's some combination of those two things, and I'm sure there's more nuance than that, that would be like a 10,000 foot view, really, really high level. Like once you have that definition, you know that that's the goal, then you can do things to objectively reach that goal. But I don't think unless you agree upon that goal, which on mass, most of us kind of do, um, that there's like an objective morality that exists out in the world. Well, let me play to this, your background in psychology real fast. If okay. somebody comes to me and they're like, well, right and wrong, how do you, what's right for you? If you were to harm somebody else and it benefited you, then that would be right for you. I mean, so you can go and steal from someone else because it benefits you and for you that would be right uh how would you approach somebody who's saying that it's all relative and and there there can be no true right or wrong well they're, they're making the locus an individual they're making the locus one individual person instead of it, trying to extrapolate it over a societal scale if you extrapolate it over a societal scale then that no longer is the case because what might seem right for you or what your desires are don't translate onto the broader society because if we existed in a society where people were killing each other and stealing each other thing other things that society wouldn't exist for very long it wouldn't be tenable so morality if you define it as what's best for an individual has that problem but if you extrapolate it over a societal scale then that problem no longer exists and in fact making an argument like that would seem trivially silly because you're just saying an individual should be able to do whatever they want and an individual is a component of that society not the entire society so it falls apart immediately well paul uh, let me come over to you how would you address this i mean how would you determine right if so, how would you know that not salting watermelon is <laughs> immoral how would you make that conclusion well, I guess I can go back to when I was a theist and when I was a kid. Uh, it's interesting that Jesus, you know, gave us the actual only two important commandments and the first one's irrelevant because it doesn't matter. But when I was a kid, my parents actually would say, if you think about individual action you would want to do, just think about would you want to live in a society where everyone made that, everyone made that choice? And if you wouldn't want to live in a society where everyone made that choice, then it's not the moral choice to make. Now that's very simplistic, but it it plays to, you know, that it talks to what Shan was saying, the society versus in general. I do think right and wrong are absolutely labels that people put on outcomes they prefer or 
yeah, outcomes that they prefer or actions that they prefer or disprefer. And we all do that. And it's the intuition that we have about what moral means and what right and wrong means that plays into the apologists or the Christians or the theists hands, because it's one of those words that everyone brings to the table their own meaning about it, but we all just kind of intuit that we're talking about the same thing, but we aren't necessarily. So you can, again, it's one of those words that if you pin someone down and try and make them define it, for example, if someone wants to define that morality is just what God says, which was what some people tells me, well, then we don't actually agree on what morality is. So I don't need to come up with an ontology for your morality because I don't even think that's the right way to define it. So they don't um, really mean that, though. I'm, I'm a chaos agent. I'm sorry. But I don't think that they really mean that when they say like the, the prescriptivists who say that morality is just what God says. I don't think they mean that, because if you if you ask them explicitly, like outright, if you say, OK, can you explain why something is right or wrong? They'll start to give justifications that fit within the framework that I just laid out where, you know, we're, we're looking at societal harm and societal flourishing, like, and, and we're you, and trying to reduce harm and increase flourishing on a societal level, they'll start to give justifications that exist within that framework. So they're acknowledging the existence of the framework when they're making the, the argument to justify their position. But really at base, their position is God said so, therefore it's moral and it requires no more justification. But they find themselves providing those justifications because they intuitively know that it needs to exist within that framework. So I don't actually think that they really mean it when they say that. Do you think I'm wrong about that? I, or at least they don't realize that they don't really mean it. Well, I I would agree that they that they, when when push comes to shove, they actually want to be able to just say that yes, torturing babies for fun is 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 wrong in in some kind of they want to appeal to this objective sense, of course. They 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 want they'll what they'll say is you're talking about epistemology, Shannon, not ontology, right? And right. so they'll say, well, we don't get caught in the weeds, the sophisticated ones will say, we don't get caught in the weeds of how we determine the ethics and how we determine what's right and wrong. What we care about is this, you know, just where did it come from? And so they kind of leapfrog over all that. Um, I realize I maybe for those in the audience who don't know what the Jesus' two commandments were that I was referring to, the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and mind. And the second is like it, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. And I think that largely when you're talking to Christians, um, if you just kind of get them to say, well, let's not talk about the God part because that doesn't affect how we talk to each other. And if we can just talk about empathy, then it, they actually do kind of get stuck in exactly what you're talking about. Then they're yeah. stuck justifying why a lack of con condemnation of slavery or why women don't can't speak in the church or like all of yeah. these kind of things they kind of get tripped up on. I'm interested in the, um, you know, people like two syllables, reductive. They like a bumper sticker. And, and we're all, we can all be guilty of this. I, I've seen atheists. I've seen people across the color and culture and, and opinion spectrum. We want simple. We want it to fit in a byline. But Dan Barker up at uh, Freedom From Religion Foundation talks about morality in terms of minimizing harm. And I think we as human beings can intuit what harm would be because we can relate to harm to us. But uh, was it Sam Harris who had written a book called Lying or Tri something like that, where he was like, it's always wrong to lie. And you and I listened to that. We're like, well, we need to be creatures of truth. Well, I buy that on the surface. But is it ever moral to lie if you minimize harm? And the example I like to use, indulge me, is... Uh, an abused spouse shows up at your door. My husband wants to kill me. Can you keep me safe? And you bring her in and lock the door and you say, go in the back room. We're going to keep you safe. And then her husband shows up at the front door with a baseball bat and he says, is my wife here? And you say, no, you have lied, but you have acted to minimize harm. And so, I mean, these are nuances that seem to disappear in the reductive you know, world that we live in. Shannon, I heard you, you say something. I don't know, you, I don't wanna get lost too much in the weeds here, but would you agree that that's the moral thing at that point? Yeah, of course it is. And I think within the framework that we're looking at, it makes sense because you're couching it against the, the context of the individual circumstance. 
So there, there aren't any like absolute absolutes within that framework. There's just thou shalt not bear false witness, right? If you say don't break, you I broke that commandment, but but there I did are no the commandments right in this framework, though, right? Because yeah. this framework, you like, which I why I think it's it's the better framework because it's you. It, I can easily justify that because I can say he was going to cause harm to her. That takes precedence over the lying. The lying is, is the lying is bad because the lying causes harm. Like if you're lying to people, that is harmful to them. You are giving them false information on purpose, likely to benefit yourself, and they're going to make incorrect decisions or determinations as a result of you misleading them. That's a potential harm to them. That is why lying is wrong. Within the framework that we're talking about, that's that you, you can say why lying's wrong. And it's because it's harmful. In that situation, that lie isn't causing harm, it's preventing harm. So contextually, there's nuance, and that's okay because the world is messy. People are messy. Circumstances are messy. And you should be able to make, you know, micro adjustments to your behavior while existing within that framework without having to deal with the ridiculousness of absolutes. But in their framework, you do have to deal with the ridiculous of absolutes, I think. And you would have to like come up to some dissonance in that situation because you have to both hold the position that lying is always wrong in every single circumstance and there is no exception because it's an absolute and then also justify why in that instance lying is okay and i've seen people have that very conundrum put in front of them and they've actually in, just said you know what no i would have to tell the truth which is crazy to me. Like that, that is a bad framework. That is a framework that is going to lead to harm, right? Because it exists in absolutes. It doesn't allow for nuance. It doesn't allow for contextual analysis. That's not good. <laughs> I don't know. Do you disagree with me on that? Or, or am I like, am I batshit crazy? But I, that seems to me like it makes sense. No, no. Those two things can exist in the same space. You can be batshit crazy. <laughs> And you can make perfect I can both be right and crazy. Paula Gia, <laughs> did you have anything before I move well, to the Well, I just one? like to go, yeah, I like to throw into the example of, for example, Rahab, who's considered a hero of the faith in Hebrews 11. And, you know, but Rahab lied to keep the Israel, Israeli spies safe as they were, you know, going in. And, and, and now, you know, she's considered a hero of the faith by the time the New Testament comes around. So even the Bible itself is incredibly inconsistent. And that's, a general problem for, as I delve in the in the Christian realm, is that a lot of times you can pull up verses to support virtually either position, right? And you name the position. I used to even play this game on uh, back in COVID days, where you know you give me a position and I'll find verses to support either side of the issue. The it's not that the Bible consistently cond condemns lying. That's the problem. Um, and so you can you can find verses where, of course, it does condemn lying. Rahab lied and she's celebrated. So when you are looking to a compilation of 66 or however many books you consider canon, you are going to find problems. And that's why I think the meta, meta ethic that Shannon was talking about is a far superior um, moral framework than a biblical interpretation when it's convenient. The same book told people that there should be slaves as the, the, the abolitionists use to say that there shouldn't be slaves. That's a problem for that. That book isn't useful at this point. So anyway, that, those are my thoughts. By the way, I want to say for those watching on video, I feel a kinship with Shannon because we're both drinking out of a coffee cup the size of a crock pot. <laughs> I saw you lift that thing and I was like, can you lift that with one hand? <laughs> I was given this uh, by my uh, stepdaughter and it's this massively, it's just huge, but I'm like, you know, some days you just have to pan down the Java. You know, there were my some days. My son gave me this too. That's, that's lovely. Um, okay. We have this in agreement, I think, all three of us. We look at the philosopher, wildly popular, and really we made him rich. Uh, the philosopher Jordan Peterson, and we wonder when his mind turned to rice pudding. Like, <laughs> what was the moment of demarcation? Would either of you like to talk a little bit about the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson and your perspective? I'm not a great fan of Jordan Peterson. I think that he his rhetoric is harmful, and I wasn't a great fan of his book. So I read, uh, 
what is it called? 12 Rules for Life or whatever. I actually read that book because I was intrigued because he caused such a big stink up here um, at U of T. Um, and he's a Canadian guy and he's a psychologist and that's my field. So I wanted to kind of read his book. I didn't like a lot of the ethics of his book. Like he was using very clear examples um, of patients that he had, like almost like case studies in the books. And ethically, I didn't think that that was great because he was using a lot of descriptive information that would have made it easy to uncover who those people were. Wait um, a minute. Is that is that a HIPAA violation, you think? Or is that one of those gray areas? I think it's a gray area because he wasn't using their real names, but he was absolutely using like real details about their life. Hmm. And I think that that for the same reason I don't like Dr. Phil for, for that reason, like using um, patients or using people's mental health in order to, you know, turn a profit in the public space, just ethically, I have personal issues with that. And I, and I didn't, I didn't like it at all. And he was actually making um, admonishments of some of his patients, like, which if the patient read the book, even if nobody else could figure out who that patient was, if the patient themselves read the book and were reading his personal opinions about them um, and his admonishments and how they were, he was using them as demonstrate for demonstration purposes for like, you know, how not to be in, in specific instances, that would be directly harmful demonstratively. So to them. And I did, I didn't like that. He's got some, uh, you know, really bizarre arguments for the existence of God. He talks about you know, the word salad stuff, the metaphysical substrate. Uh, what, what the hell is a metaphysical substrate? I don't know what to do with stuff like that. It's kind of those deepities that, uh, a lot of the apologists use. I don't know. Paul, did you have any thoughts or, uh, well, my thoughts are that I feel like I don't understand why Christians in general or theists in general support Jordan Peterson and promote him in the same way. I don't understand why they would promote a Donald Trump in that neither of those men, Jordan Peterson, as you said, when he's asked a God-related question, he punts as if he can. He does not want to answer that question. I think because if anyone found out his true opinion, he would lose half his audience because he doesn't really believe it. The other thing he's doing, which I do not agree with at all, is advocate that because religion is a useful fiction, because he finds utility in it, that therefore it's good and let's let it prosper. Uh, I find that any way that Jordan Peterson professes that religion is useful, there are secular alternatives that do less harm. So why are you promoting this delve into mythology and that, you know, Jonah, he, I interpret Jonah as this great, you know, um, reawakening experience and all the, all the ways he spins these stories for that crowd that he's talking to. And of course, you know, he's now in that right wing sphere. And so he can't come out and say, no, nah, I don't believe this stuff. It's just, it's, it's useful to fool you people who are listening to me. Why people celebrate that and by therefore, you know, prop him up baffles me. I don't, I mean, do you have thoughts? Like why, well, I, why you know, would they I, promote this guy? I, I don't, you know, I've been blinking my eyes at the evangelical right in this country for, for, and, and, more every day to the point where it's almost like uh, I'm about to have a, a stroke. Um, but I am interested in something you brought up. So let me take that stream off the river. The idea, and I on the surface, I get it. Religion provides community. There are lovely, wonderful, moral, kind, good people who are Christians, who are Muslims, who are Hindus, etc., the structure gives them comforts, community. There are efforts that are charitable. Um, they want to be inspired. They love the music. Does religion that has a supernatural component to it, is there any context where you think, yeah, maybe it's okay? Maybe it, maybe it gives people comfort in a tough, difficult, often cruel world? Or is it always a cheat? I've said often in the past and I'll say it in the future and I'll say it now that if religion was completely innocuous, if it wasn't harmful, if it didn't attempt to enact harm onto society, you would, nobody would even know my name. You wouldn't have heard from me. I wouldn't have said a word. 
like I, I would have just gone, I would have just changed my belief system and just walked off into the sunset and gone about my life. But it does absolutely cause harm and it's demonstrably causing harm. That like that just 100% is the case. Like we can see it. We we talk to people about it. We can watch it manifest in society right now because religion is attempting to very much permeate like politics and the social structure and that's causing harm to people and they're talking about it. It's a very different question of could it be an, could it be something that is just innocuous? Could it be something that's just not harmful? And I think maybe if you don't take it seriously would be my answer to that. If you're if you're not fully invested in really believing it to the nth degree, then maybe it won't be harmful. But Christianity is based on a book and that book has harmful components to it. You know, things about slavery, things about grape, things about misogyny, things about societal structures that that aren't great and that's always going to be the case because it's immutable. It's not going to change. So I don't think in and of itself, if it's taken seriously, it can ever not be harmful. But I think that people can invest in it to degrees that make their, their belief just kind of non, a non-issue, if that makes sense. I think there's gradients of it. It's like uh, when I see, and I'm I'm so thankful. I always say this, and forgive my, uh, my listeners. Please forgive me for saying it for the thousandth time. And I've had some of them on the show. Devout believers, they love them some Jesus, and they genuinely align with me. They call themselves, they identify as Christians, and they have five Bibles in their house, and they probably quote scripture and go to Sunday, go to meeting, right? But they have decided they're going to skip over the parts where God judged LGBT people, you know, yeah. and had the sodomite stoned and ex children executed and rape victims forced to marry the rapist after the dad was paid off and hell, they don't believe God would ever make hell. So they've kind of custom fitted their own religion. And then whenever we see the Christian nationalists going ape shit in this country, they say, well, that's not true Christianity. And it's one of the biggest gripes I have right now with the moderate Christian because I think they're they're trying to distance their religion from the, from the fundamentals of the religion. Um, I'll throw it out there, Paul. I guess I'll well, start I take with a, you. Yeah, and I take a harder stance on all this. So Shannon said, you you know, if, if religion didn't do active harm, that you, you wouldn't know her. I would still be out there, absolutely. Even if you could show that, you know, practicing these religions is is entirely benevolent, because. I think that there's, it's impossible not to do harm when you have an epistemology that takes on false ideas as true. That now, perhaps if someone ever came up with something uniquely religious that there is no secular counterpart for, fine, then we'll have a discussion. But I've yet to come across that example. So as long as religion is just one way to do it, the fact that you are espousing and teaching your children some kind of way of thinking of making decisions about the world that takes in unwarranted supernatural beliefs or any or you know anti-science beliefs you these permeate these become when when you start thinking this way it's the kind of thinking that made me think that the earth was young for so so much of my life for example and therefore because i needed to think the earth was young i needed to think about that there was massive conspiracies in scientific and intellectual fields and you just start bringing on board oh maybe i shouldn't go to the doctor like just there's there's um ways of thinking that lead to harm because of the way of thinking that is propping up the social benefits of religion so i am gonna be out here even if you find this benevolent version of, of any religion that you're still practicing because uh, to me, I care about whether it's true or not. And once we've talked about whether it's true or not, then let's talk about whether it's harmful or not. Okay, let me throw this out since we're going to attempt more nuance. People have a difficult time with this, but the perpetrators of bad ideas can at the same time in the same space be victims of bad ideas. And I am amazed at the resistance I get to that. 
when I, you know, someone goes out and they're a Christian nationalist and they are, I don't know, they're doing and saying really pretty bad things. Many aren't aware of the environment they came out of, the conditioning, the indoctrination, the cocoon, you know, the shell, the conspiracy stuff that they, uh, that is their normal. When did we lose the ability to say, yeah, they're doing great harm, but we also need to understand the uh, the antecedents, right? We, the things that came before that produced the agent of harm and then see them also as victim. All right, Shannon, throw <laughs> some psychology at me on this one. I, I think it's just a matter of we want to be able to point to the harmful person chide and condemn them, identify them as harmful, and then distance ourselves from them. Like we want to, we don't want to be able to find a villain. And in the age that we live in now, like in the information age, it's very easy to find a villain. Like instead, instead of people just being, you know, someone off in the distance who might have an idea about someone like you, you can, you can be faced with them consistently. So you feel that harm more directly on, on a broader scale so you want to like just get away from that person because you see them as doing harm you don't really see them as you know just a human who's multifaceted you see them specifically as someone who's causing harm and i think for that's that's kind of a valid position to have because you shouldn't have to put yourself in harm's way but i do think that it does go to the nth degree because i think that we kind of break off into factions and because we've broken off into factions, we've become increasingly polarized. And that increasing polarization causes insulation in the groups on both sides. And that's that's what I think is dangerous. And that's where I think that the dehumanization comes from. Because dehumanization happens when we see people as a member of an outgroup. And now, the, now we're very much forming different factions that we can clearly identify as outgroups, giving them labels, and then... Give, seeing everybody within that out group as somebody who is bad just definitionally because they belong to that group. Now imagine if someone had stumbled across me when I was a Rush Limbaugh listener, right? When I when, when I read Ann Coulter and watched Fox News and you know went to and did think we were one nation under God, and I always think uh, I wonder how I would have been treated if Twitter would have been around then. You know, would someone have lobbed the grenade over the wall at me and written me off and said, I had to be crushed. I'm a lost cause. I'm an idiot. Or would they have made an attempt to try to engage the flesh and blood three-dimensional human being? And I've been guilty. Now, I don't give quarter to like the sociopath. I'm Ted Cruz, Marjorie Taylor. I'm not talking about those people. I'm talking about the everydays. Paul, you want to weigh in on this one before I move on? Sure. Well, I one of the things that frustrates me greatly is when Christian or when people on my side of fence, non-believers want to say, you can't, those people can't be reasoned with, or they can't change their mind. And I stare blankly at them. Like I am a single digits of years out of this. And of course I, like I changed my mind. So I was as hardcore to it as anyone. Uh, Seth, I think you feel probably the same way. And that, you know, we were able to, to come out of this so now I, I have to jump in real quick paul hang on so if i come to you and i show you the meme that says you cannot reason people out of a belief they weren't reasoned into to begin with you see that and the vein on your forehead pops out like absolutely. and I have, I have that reaction too right? yeah no i think that is absolutely ridiculous because you think of any position you just hold without without scrutiny of course evidence will should be able to there's some level of evidence that can bring you out of anything you hold whether you hold to it rationally or not so yeah i don't don't like that at all and i think one of the things that i try and do and i one of the things i love about you seth is that i am for me it's still so fresh that i can't help but have empathy and i do think that in some ways i was a victim both a victim of um, my community and, and things, but I also I got to confess, I was a self victim. I kind of bought into the black and white thinking and built my own cage around me. I ended up becoming more fundamentalist, I think, than the, the people around me due to my own uh, misplaced ideas. So that empathy, man, I, I, I just, I want people to feel comfortable talking to me and for me to never lose that notion that uh, we are all 
just a product of the information that we're given and the environment that we have. I mean, obviously there's genetic components, but um, that that someone is hopelessly lost uh, on either side of the fence is that that's not true. We we need to empathize, and we need so victim is the wrong word. But I do empathize with someone who can hold these ideas, um, and I hope I never lose that. Can so, I interject? Oh, for, go I'm ahead, so, Shannon. I'm go ahead. So sorry. I want. To, I just want to say something because I think when we have this conversation, we tend to focus on um, the polarization, and that is important to like focus on and analyze. There's nuance for sure, but also, I, I like. I think that what what people are getting at when they have this discussion is, you know, people are being unreasonable, and they're saying people are bad on on the internet or in person, and they should be doing something different. But it's it's also worth pointing out that a lot of these people are actively causing harm, and it's not up to the people that they're harming to talk them out of that. I mean, it's okay if you're if someone's hitting you with a bat to say that guy's hitting me with a bat. Somebody should stop him, right? Like that the harm, or or I need to get away from him, and nobody else should go around him. He's hitting people with bats. Right. Like you would you wouldn't ch chastise somebody or admonish them at that moment that he was wailing on you with the bat would not be the moment that a victim would say, tell me about your childhood. Can you right. speak to me about the cultural influences that brought you to this moment of violence? You know, your your reaction right. must be different. Right. Yeah, I don't think that it's as black and white as like even we initially were talking about, because like the wh what I said is true. There's nuance and that we are becoming more polarized and we are outgrouping in, like at a rapid breakneck speed. And then that does make it easier for us to just other people entirely and kind of strip them of their humanity. And that's a bad thing. But also if people are doing bad things, the people who they are doing those bad things to or encouraging society to you know, push down, it shouldn't be up to them to, you know, have respectability discourse with them to, to be like, okay, well, I guess the onus is on me to see your humanity, even though you're not seeing mine, and have a rational discussion with you. Great for the people who are, ca who are capable of doing that, who want to do that. I think that there's great benefit in that. But that is not a reasonable expectation to have of any of everybody in that circumstance does that make sense yeah that makes sense. I, like, I think there's nuance that needs to be explored if you want to actually get to the root of the issue and that's an important component to the conversation about it shannon you were never religious do i remember that right no i was an anglican i was competitively religious i was the first oh. altar girl in my church okay. i was con i was confirmed into the faith at eight years old and i was the only female altar girl at eight years old at my church because I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but if, if someone tells me that's not things that girls usually do, I say, hold my beer. I'll be right back after I'm done doing it. <laughs> Bite me. <laughs> well, then good. I get to ask this question. I'm keeping you long that I anticipated, but we're, I, we have what we call momentum in broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And I just enjoy, you and I could probably chat all day. Um, do you look back at the shit you used to believe? And the further you get away from it, you, you it becomes more ridiculous, like exponentially, day by day. And you think, how in the world did I ever hold that belief? Do you have that feeling? And is there a specific belief or three that fits that category? You're going to get such different answers from both Paul and myself. I want them. Uh, I'll start with Paul. Come on. You're freshly, relatively out of the faith. Do you look back more and more and go, what the Fuck. Well, obviously, the, the ones that are most actively embarrassing for me are the science related beliefs that I held. So, for example, that, you know, humans and dinosaurs were definitely around at the same time and the ark and the flood definitely happened. And, the, you know, the earth is 6,000 years old. Like, those are the ones that are a little more actively embarrassing, right? And, and, and I've definitely looked back um, and ashamed about that. A lot of the other things. Um, I think we, we kind of opened this with, we talked a little bit about how, you know, yeah, I would make this sacrifice now. The more I think about atonement and, and sin and this, the whole human endeavor of selling us that we're sinful, which is a weird concept that we've somehow, we're somehow harming 
a god that can't be harmed and that that demands retribution like that all the more i think about those nuances those are the ones that i'm now kind of like man this this just doesn't add up and yeah, but i was the, but the praise songs were kind of glossing over <laughs> all of this stuff uh, yeah no i'm with you i think the more we delve into those details now you know the one that gets me and i'm shocked i didn't pick it up what you know you, i think you brought up the commandment thou shalt love the lord thy god and i thought how can you command someone to love someone else right i mean you you realize that you love someone but how 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 does compulsory love even work and i never even occurred to me oh i should go love god mm. but love doesn't work that way i'll let you uh jump in shannon beliefs beliefs that i had prior i like I had a very different experience than Paul because I was never in like a fundamentalist type faith. I was an Anglican. So what I'm the most embarrassed about is the fact that I didn't hold my faith to scrutiny at all. So I realized that I was holding embarrassing positions after I like started to try to become more faithful. Like so a bad thing happened to me and I turned to religion because that, as you do, right, as you're told, you're supposed to, that's what you're supposed to do when, when you need help is you're supposed to turned to God. So I turned to my Bible and I started actually reading it for the first time. And that's when all the questions started coming up. Like when I got to Jephthah and I was like, oh, okay. So God loves human sacrifice because that guy just killed his own daughter. So like God, that, that's a human sacrifice, right? So <laughs> why? That's not good. And then I got to numbers and I was like, oh shit, God causes abortions. If you suspect your wife maybe cheated on you, you can just, you know, God will just take the baby right out of her. So how am I holding this position on abortion? I realized that I wasn't scrutinizing anything. What I'm the most embarrassed of is that I just allowed a faith to be placed in my head without question and believed leadership instead of formulating my own opinions. And I will never do that again. And I'm raising a child who will never do that. I'm raising a child who will formulate his own opinions, who I'm teaching him how to think, not what to think. And I live a massive portion of my life being taught what to think and just accepting that without even realizing that I was until I actively attempted to, to hold it to scrutiny and see how it compared to the reality around me. So what I'm the most embarrassed about isn't a specific belief, it's how I lived my life. That's what I'm the most embarrassed about. That mind frame that I was in, that mindset where I just allowed someone external to me to tell me because I believed that they had authority what I should believe. That's All right. Here at the last couple of bullet points, and um, uh, you don't have to answer, but I'm looking for, is there an apologetic argument that you think actually that's not bad? I mean, it's not that it's correct, but is there an apologetic argument where you're like, well, actually, that's an intelligently reasoned question or challenge that we can engage with? And what's the apologetic argument that makes you want to put your head through drywall and scream? So I'm looking for, is there a best and worst as far? And I'll start with apologia because, Paul, you're, you engage mm. apologists in those arguments all the time. Is there one that impresses you and then one or two that make you crazy? Uh, impress no i do think that the one that i understand why it's compelling is the fine tuning argument uh because it does obviously we are in this universe where we exist and why is there something rather than nothing i guess ultimately becomes that that question and if you're the kind of person who just needs to keep asking why one more time every time something's happened Ultimately, I, I don't think any scientist or myself or anyone can satisfy you in just saying, well, maybe the universe is a brute fact, just like God is a brute fact. I get how that's not internally satisfying. Um, so that, that whole fine-tuning argument, why is there something rather than nothing? Not, not terrible in the same way in that that's, that's more of a yearning, questioning type thing as opposed to putting forth some kind of uh, terrible syllogism. Um, maybe come back to me for the worst one. I need to think on that for a sec. 
Well, you've uh, got quite a Rolodex. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean, you know, going through the oh, work yeah, of Ken Ham and William Lane Craig mm. and Frank Turner. I mean, apologists to me. And I personally would like to throw them all in a van and then just let them fight as they drive over the, you know, I'd send them to Canada, but you'd send them right back to me. Um, We're building a wall. <laughs> uh, Shannon, do you have a best or worst or both? Uh, I actually, I'm going to align with Paul is the the fine tuning is the one to me that like, I can understand how it's adopted. Um, so I'm not going to extrapolate or ex sorry, expound upon that because Paul kind of explained it. The worst one to me is actually one we talked about earlier and it's the Kalam because it's functionally just like walking up to me and going, the universe has a cause. And I'm like, okay, like, cool. <laughs> now what? <Yeah. laughs> and... And because it like it doesn't connect the premises to the conclusion at all. It's just a, like the conclusion's just an assertion. The universe has a cause, therefore God caused it. Eh, eh, eh. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> what are you guys doing? Like who looked at that and was like, fine, like this cup exists, therefore God is functionally the same argument. It, it, I just think it's ridiculous. I think the one that gets me is. Um... Science has proven the Bible. I mean, or they'll make a claim like that. And then they just go like, hey, hey have a nice day. And, and uh, there's an assumption. The founding fathers were all Christian. You know, there's zero digging. There's zero research. Or they, you know, pull up a website by David Barton, who's a pseudo historian who happens to agree with them. It's these weird claims that only exist on the surface. There's been no actual digging. They don't know why God's in the pledge. They don't know why God's on the money. They don't know the positions of the founding fathers, or maybe they deify them, even though they didn't allow women to serve in government and own slaves and were far from perfect human beings. And I just feel like this is, you know, they make a claim and then they congratulate themselves and leave. Um, that makes me crazy. Back to you, Paul. Did you find one? Yeah. So a few that are kind of related, like blind watchmaker just always just makes me incredibly angry because it, probably because I definitely fell for it, not understanding how science works. But uh, no, the worst one of all is, is look at the trees. It's just the, <laughs> the here we, there's enough evidence, Romans 120, God gave us enough evidence that, that you sh you do know that he exists. <clears throat> and I know your thoughts better than you do, because my book tells me that you know you, you really believe. So you're just suppressing the truth and the righteousness. Um, to me, that's the absolute worst one, because the only thing that we can know for certain, better than we even know we exist, is the content of our thoughts. We don't know if our thoughts are true, but we know our content of our thoughts better than anyone else can. And if you're coming at me and saying, my book tells me that the one thing you know uh, is wrong, well then, no, you're, I'm justified in saying, no, your, your book is just wrong. Your book doesn't know that I know that God exists. Well, uh, hang on. So are you saying that they are making the claim that even the atheist believes in God were just in sin and denial? Absolutely. That's the very common, just everyone, just everyone knows that God exists and, and you're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness is, is the phrase that they like to use. And that, yeah, so they do assert that literally every human on the planet who's capable of thinking knows that God's exists in their heart. God has given us enough evidence, his divine qualities, his invisible qualities, divine nature. It's written on our hearts. And because the Bible says it's written on our hearts that we know that God exists, th the Bible can't be wrong. So therefore, Paul, the thoughts that you know that you have are wrong. You really do believe you're suppressing somehow. So that's, I get that one all the time and it's my least favorite. There's uh, I think they call that in creation and in conscience, God is revealed all around you. You'd have to be blind or stupid or just in denial or lying to ignore the, uh, the fact of God and the designer, the creator, the father all around you. Last thing, I'm going to start with Shannon again. What are we doing poorly as activists, maybe even counterproductive? What are you seeing out there in the ether? You're like me, you're on the front lines. And I, I, there are things that frustrate me about some of the tactics. What, are we, what do you think we're doing well or need to do more of? And what do you think is counterproductive and we need to walk away from? I don't know, Shannon, you want to start or you want me to punt over to, uh, to Paul real quick? 
I'll give oh, you a chance. To... I've got some clear answers. I okay. think that we need to do more community building and creating spaces for people that are going through deconversion so that because people are coming out of religion all the time and it's difficult for them to find their footing. And this is a bit of a space that's that's kind of chaos. It's not not just all, all activists are chaos. That's not what I'm saying. But like the the space when you come out of religion is difficult to find your footing on. Um, when you're kind of like rebuilding everything about your your perception of of the world and your epistemologies. So I think we need to do a better job of creating spaces for people who are deconverting and just creating broader community as people who are non-believers just in general. Um, what I think that we're doing a good job of right now is um, kind of making some of the arguments seem tired like a lot of people who otherwise wouldn't have been familiar with things like divine hiddenness or the kalam um are now more exposed like granted so somewhere between like a rudimentary level to like an expert level like somewhere in that gradient but a lot of people really understand the counter apologetics a lot better because we have so many different types of communicators in this space looking at it from so many different perspectives now because this space is becoming more diverse and more varied um, with all different types of educators and all different types of different fields really coming to the forefront. I think that that is starting to, to happen a lot more. And I think that that's, I think that's great. I'm seeing less of, and I'm thankful I still see it, but in the meme verse, you know, these zingers, Science flies you to the moon. Religion flies you into buildings. And there's always the twin towers. And I'm like, you know, it's just, science has also created thermonuclear weapons. You know what I'm saying? This, I, this reductive idea that science could not ever or has not ever been misused or that yeah. people have not been able to use a religious model to do something else, even though the foundations are incorrect. It's so freaking reductive. Religion is a mental illness. There's a page on Facebook called Religion is a Mental Illness. I did a whole video on that. It's pinned, it's pinned to the top of my YouTube channel. It pisses me off the most. I was not mentally ill when I was, a, it just makes me crazy, Shannon. Makes me right. crazy. Like there's nothing about my disposition, personality, intellect, nothing about that changed the moment I realized that God didn't exist. But functionally what you're saying, and this is why it's wild to me, is that I was mentally ill and then I changed my mind about something and that cured my mental illness. That's what you're saying, which is bananas, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's bananas and completely unhelpful. It's functionally like saying, well, if you have chronic depression, you can just, you can change your mind one day and just not have chronic depression because that's, that's the model under which I think mental illness operates that you can have it, change your mind about something and then not have it anymore. That's the position you have to hold. And it's, it's crazy. I, I went into way more detail in the video. It's pinned to the top of my channel. I went through the DSM. I went through all of like a bunch of history of mental illness, what the definition of religion is and how it's used in the field, why it does and doesn't apply all of it in great detail. And still in the comments section, after I lay it out and put all the resources down and like, here's the links, here's all the papers, here's the actual DSM, here's the, the ICU, here's all of the stuff that you need to put this together for yourself. People were literally still saying, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you say. Several of them assumed I was religious and came and I'm assuming probably didn't even watch it because I say I'm an atheist within the first 10 minutes of the video and are like, yeah, you religious people constantly try. I'm so you didn't even watch it. <laughs> you didn't even, yeah. it's crazy to me. Well, that, I mean, I think it's uh, really a evidence of our own humanity, the idea that we think as higher primates and quote unquote, you know, skeptics, et cetera, that we are immune from bad ideas or reductive thinking. I'm doing a whole speech on this later on in the year that uh, gets into many of the things I think we do that are counterproductive. You, you can't go on a, a religious page and tell everybody, grow up, and expect everybody on the page to be like, you know what? 
I am really a, an intellectual infant, but now that you've done this drive by and told me that I am, I'm going to now become mature. And it, it just, it, I, I really, really get frustrated. I think the thing that I'm seeing more of that I love is we are educating people about identity beliefs, why people rally and defend and why we have this visceral emotional reaction to identity. What, what is an identity belief? What's the psychology at play? How do you, you know, make the crack that lets in the light? Understanding that kind of thing, epistemology. I'm seeing more of those discussions. I'm trying to lead more of those discussions. I'm encouraged by that. I think that's one thing that I'd like to see certainly more of. Paul, best and worst, uh, you got anything for me? I just, maybe it's a counter to some of this stuff is it, it's tough to know where the line is because I know in my own deconstruction journey, I needed Bill Nye, but I also needed George Carlin and Ricky Gervais to intelligently poke some fun at, uh, you know, the sacred cows, as you've once put it, Seth. Um, now, let me jump I, in, I, Paul, though. Is that the difference? Like, because I go hard at the ideas. Hell, I made the story of Susie video, right? Mm -hmm. uh, going after the ideas and saying it's safe to do so and going after the person who holds the ideas. Would you draw a line of demarcation between the two? I absolutely would. Um, but I, I fear that sometimes when we say these kind of things, what, what I get my audience coming back to me is like, you're, you're wanting to tone police or you want everyone to use my tone. And I don't think that the tone that I use, while I think it it was a refreshing voice at the time, there's more, a lot more like it now. Um, I, I do think that all tones are needed, but I, I do love the, what you just specified there, that the, the sarcasm, the biting, the the attack is is not at the the intellect or the character or what or you know all the, not be smirching you're right it's it's to make fun of well this how would this arc idea even work or you know do these ten commandments make sense so but i do think there is room for as as you said just for all tones so that i don't think there's one right way to do it even though i choose to never swear because i the kind of christian i was would have stopped listening when I hear the first F word, well, then, you know, I'm just everything after that is white noise. Um, I do understand why sometimes more passion, you know, is, is a complimentary thing. So I do, I guess, love that we are getting more of those voices. And as you say, I would encourage going after the ideas. I, I'm going to adopt that now. That's a great, great word. What do you say? So you uh, defer the swearing to Shannon. So it's like a <laughs> sort of correct. a cosmic right. equilibrium taking place there. <laughs> We, we have fun debates in our house as to whether the Christian that I was would have thought that the Christian that Shannon was was a Christian. We we, we go have. back and we role play our old versions, <laughs> and we definitely wouldn't have thought that each other were Christians in these own ways. It's it's kind of fun. Oh, the one we did was, uh, I'm sorry, you're Catholic? Oh, I, I thought you were Christian. Uh, yeah. we, we totally didn't. Uh, like, oh, Catholics are definitely not Christians, you know? <laughs> And then you see the splintering in the faith. Um, I'm sorry, are you a Southern Baptist or a free will or an independent Baptist? Uh, you know, it's so yeah, we yeah, splinter in right. infinite regress again. Yeah. We once had a 20 minute argument in our house about the appropriate way to take communion. Both of us as atheists were arguing about the appropriate way to take communion because it was, I didn't realize how vastly different it was at my church versus at his church. I was like, what do you mean you pass around a tray and like you eat a piece of bread? Like you get a tiny wafer, you have to go to the altar, you have to sit in a certain way, you have to use a certain cup, you have to say a specific prayer, you have to like, you don't just, you don't just, you don't even stand up. I was like, I was mortified. I was like, what do you mean you don't even stand up? You just sit there and passively receive it. But then he <laughs> thought that mine was crazy and that we were worshiping idols. And we were, it was just, it was 20 minutes of two atheists who will never take communion again in their life arguing about whose church. <laughs> was I think uh, our, we, we our had a Baptist church and they had uh they actually brought out I, right in front of everybody boxes of saltine crackers so it wasn't even like the little holy looking wafer it was we knew well this isn't the body of christ this is the body of nabisco lightly salted <laughs> and handed out to everybody i don't know i would be curious to be a fly on the wall during most dinner time conversations at your house i don't see a ton of small talk 
I, I, I don't, do I get that vibe? Is this everything become a commentary on the culture and philosophy and religion? Shannon needed, uh, Shannon's had some, just some difficult days at work these last few months. And so I, I spend my days trying to find videos like, um, why feminism, why the Bible says that feminism is wrong videos for Shannon to, to, to <laughs> unwind with. This is, this is the kind of thing you just do to relax. Wait, wait, you purposefully light that fuse? You just oh, he say he pisses me off on purpose on a daily basis because he likes to watch me go off. Literally, I came home from work last night after we like had dinner and he he was recording a video. After that, when he came out, he put on I don't know if you know this podcast. It's called Stand to Reason. It's this guy Greg Kokel who I just he wrote a book called Tactics that I really don't like because it's just about how to manipulate people. Anyway, I don't like this guy and I don't like his institution. But he did a podcast specifically on um, why feminism is bad basically like so somebody asked a question to him which was i have a friend who doesn't want to teach their child their female child about christianity because they think it's against feminism and he just went off about the most ridiculous shit for like 25 minutes and i just drank wine and paul will pause it and just listen to me yell and then i'll walk away and i'll come back and he'll play it again and that that's how he likes to spend his time it's just winding me up watching me lose my shit and wander around the house screaming and he just sits there and that's like, I'm his entertainment for the evening. And we talk. So you're not it. the, you're both agents of chaos. It's, but I it had to listen true. to the fucking Gary Habermas book for like <laughs> three and a half weeks when he bought that goddamn thing into the house. <laughs> the motherfucking Gary Habermas book. Oh. God damn that Gary Habermas book. I didn't mean yeah, to get her see? started. I didn't Besides mean to coffee hit. Table. No, but we are a weird couple. I think if that was your impression that we're a weird couple. You are on the money. <laughs> no, I, 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 fire and ice. I love it, and uh, I just love you both to death. You're so smart, and I, th I love your approach. And I, I've said this to you privately. I'm not just uh, saying it for the benefit of the audience to, to make it sound more lofty than than it is. I, I appreciate the fact that you are nuanced and you see people in three dimensions. And I think you are uh, interested in discussions more than shouting at each other, and that's refreshing. So links to both of uh, your channels, Shannon Q, Paula Gia, in the description box. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to bump into each other on the road, and I will uh, try to make a list or get a list from you, Paul, of things not to bring up to get <laughs> Shannon to, to her head explode over dinner, or maybe we will. I don't know. One or the other, I'm going to have to have. My list. moral anarchist <laughs> is going to have to have that discussion before we meet again. Thank you both for coming. Great to talk to you. Thanks. Thank you, Seth.